aspect of the one serious reform that would actually give you universal health care, which is you know, you've got to have a government-sponsored program that people can enter in, uh, in competition with the existing private ones. That's the, th that's the way you get some serious cost containment. Everybody knows that. That's why much of the health care debate that's about to happen is going to focus on it. Markets uh, just don't provide options which today are crucial options. Uh, so, for example, a market system permits you to decide whether to buy uh, you know, one brand of car or another. But the market doesn't permit you to decide, I don't want a car, I want a public transportation system. And the same is true of a wide range of other uh, matters of social significance, like whether to help the uh, disabled widow across town. Okay, that's what uh, social that's what communities decide. Uh, that's what democracy is about. Uh, that's what social solidarity is about. Uh, mutual aid and building institutions by people for the benefit of people. And all of that threatens, you know, the, the a system of domination and control right at its heart. All right, this year, in 2008, something changed. For the first time, uh, the Democrats began putting forward programs which are towards what the population has wanted for decades. I don't really get there, but at least they're in that direction. Uh, first Edwards, then uh, Obama and Clinton. I don't believe that government can or should run health care. But I also don't think insurance companies should have free reign to do as they please. That's why any plan I sign must include an insurance exchange a one-stop shopping marketplace where you can compare the benefits, costs, and track records of a variety of plans, including a public option to increase competition and keep insurance companies honest. Well, what happened between 2004 and 2008? Uh, public opinion didn't change. It's been pretty much the same for decades. What changed is that manufacturing industry uh, started coming out in favor of a national health care system because they're being smashed by the costs of the privatized system in the United States. Like General Motors says, it costs them uh, over $1,000 more to uh, produce a car in Detroit than across the Canadian border uh, because they have a rational health care system, more rational, not perfect, but better. Uh, well, you know, when a sector of concentrated American capital becomes interested in something, it starts to become politically possible and have political support. You know, these are things that people ought to be discussing and think about. What does that tell you about our, about functioning democracy? Let's take, say, the poorest countries in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, Haiti and Bolivia. Uh, in Haiti, there was uh, an election in 1990, uh, which really was an extraordinary display of democracy. There were uh, uh, grassroots movements, popular movements that developed in the slums and in the hills, which nobody was paying any attention to. And they managed, even without any resources, to sweep into power their own candidate. Uh, a, uh, populist priest, Jean Bertrand Aristide. Uh, take the second poorest country, Bolivia. Uh, they had an election in 2005 that's uh, almost unimaginable in the West, uh, certainly here, anywhere. Uh, the person elected into office was indigenous. That's the most oppressed population in the hemisphere. That is, those who survived. Uh, he's a poor peasant. How did he get in? Uh, well, he, uh, he got in because uh, there were, again, uh, mass popular movements uh, which uh, elected their own representative. And they are the source of the programs, which are serious ones. It's, uh, they're real issues, and people know them. Uh, control over resources, uh, cultural rights, uh, social justice, and so on. Uh, furthermore, the election was just an event that was a particular stage in a long continuing struggle a lot before and a lot after. A couple of years ago, they, there was a major struggle over uh, privatization of water, an effort to, which would in effect deprive uh, uh, 
good part of the population of water to drink. And it was a bitter struggle. A lot of people were killed, but they won it uh, through international solidarity, in fact, which helped. What is communism? Um, it, it's Chile, a communist country. I mean, its economy is based on a nationalized, but copper is, copper is their main export. It happens to be a very efficient nationalized company, Codelco, which is the core of the Chilean economy. Uh, we call Chile the model of the free market. Uh, yeah, its main export industry is nationalized. Uh, land reform is supposed to be in favor. You know, that's uh, lines for progress and so on, which don't like it when somebody else is doing it in a way which uh, leads to a successful defiance and uh, taking matters into your own hands. But what does it mean to call it a communist country? Um, did they have land reform for Russia? Well, it's, it's just curse words. They don't mean anything. Okay, yeah. You don't like it, it's communism. Right. If we do like it, it's democracy. It could be the same thing. In fact, what's the United States? Does the United States have a market economy? I mean, do you use a computer? Do you use the internet? Do you use uh, telecommunications? Uh, do you buy things at Walmart, which come in container shipping? Mm -hmm. so, all that comes out of the state sector. No. I mean, that's what MIT is about. A lot of that stuff's developed right here. Public funding, public takes the costs and the risks. It's developed in the state sector, often in the state sector for decades. Computers and the internet were in the states, basically, publicly funded to places like MIT and others for about almost three decades before they were handed over to private corporations. What's that? Is it communist? Pick whatever word you want. I mean, the core notion of at least traditional socialism is that working people have to be in control of production and communities have to be in control of their own lives and so on. The Soviet Union was the exact opposite of that. The working people had no control over anything. They were uh, virtual slaves. I mean, the Soviet Union was called a socialist society, and it was called that by the two major propaganda operations in the world, uh, the U.S., the Western one, and the Soviet one. They both called it socialism for opposite reasons. Uh, the West called it socialism in order to defame socialism by associating it with this uh, miserable tyranny. The Soviet Union called it socialism in order to gain whatever to, to benefit from the moral appeal that true socialism had among the large parts of the general world population. It's just like when an American politician goes somewhere and his pollsters tell him, say so-and-so, and he says it. What I walked through in the case of the Clinton, the, the essay on 1992, I looked at industries significantly above the mean in support of Clinton. Uh, you, know, you know, oil and gas, capital intensive exporters, aircraft, computers, investment banking. That investment bankers keep showing over and over in the Democratic Party, going back to the New Deal. My fellow Americans, after these four good, hard years, I still believe in a place called hope, a place called America. In the 1996 elections, Tom Ferguson has pointed out that the election was to a large extent bought toward the end by the telecommunications industry, which poured a huge amount of money into it, enough to get Clinton elected, in fact. The 96 thing really does look rather like 2000, something like three quarters of the business community was strongly anti-Clinton. I don't think that percentage changed that much. So you're in a situation where I'm gonna say, I'm gonna stipulate two thirds to three quarters of the business community wants Bush. The hullabaloo if you elect Gore would be quite a lot. Some of the labor guys thought maybe we should have some marches to sort of protest this. They clearly were advised don't do this. If the situation had been reversed and Gore had in fact, you know, won five to four, I think you would have seen 
almost chaotic scenes of the type where you had Republicans paying guys to go down into Florida and actually, you know, demonstrate. The consensus candidate in the business community was winning. Throw the hand in and, and collect your tax cut, too, was, I think, the dominant sentiment. These guys weren't trying that hard. You know, and Kerry th clearly threw the hand in too fast on 2004. In the end, the business folks won't turn the place into a shambles. They'll take a shot at it, try, and if they lose, okay, we'll take our tax cut and we'll come back next year with more of the same. Oh, see, I made Lewis a bet here. The Lewis bet me that we couldn't both get rich and put you on the poorhouse at the same time. He didn't think we could do it. I won. I lost. One dollar. Thank you, Lewis. After you. Certainly. <laughs> Stock market prices actually reflect major investor knowledge of campaign contributions. We know that congressmen and senators earn ex the highest rates of return in recorded history on their portfolios, which means they're being given inside information. And that doesn't show in any campaign contribution. I had a colleague at the University of Texas. He did a paper called Death of a Congressman. What he quickly discovers is that if they die unexpectedly, the stocks of the companies they're close to crash that afternoon. That theme was picked up by some folks on Indonesia and Malaysia, where they looked at how the Asia crisis affected the stocks of, remember when Mater and his rival, uh, Anwar, went down in Malaysia at, at Mater's hands. And it turned out the stocks of the companies that Anwar was close to crashed. They went down by something, my memory is about 22, 23 percent in the space of a week or two. But that was what political patronage was worth in Malaysia. I looked at that paper and I said to my, my friend, Joachim Folk, you know, we could do, we could use this technique, which basically what you do is you estimate what the stock market's doing over about six, six months before or so. You try to sort of define a little event window, which is real tight. The idea is track what stocks do on average and then see if the ones that are politically connected or that you think might do better on average than that. And so we took that method over on probably the most famous argument about political money ever, which is, you know, the coming to power of Adolf Hitler. We worked this through, uh, it took something like three or four years, and what we showed was like the last 25 years of American history and German history on this was all wrong. That in fact, yeah, big business in fact did fund Hitler, a big chunk of it, sort of somewhat loosely the classical Nuremberg hypothesis is really right. You know, steel companies, IG Farben, Siemens, things like that, yeah, they were all into uh, this. And their stocks do move hugely, excessively. Uh, excess returns, as they say.